Thank you, everyone, for taking the time to come and listen. Um, I hope uh, there'll be some uh, ideas that will come out of this uh, that you can apply in your own work or ways that you can start to think about your students um, and the work that they're doing in a slightly um, different way. Um, I often like to begin with just the idea, the question, how, do, how does knowledge get created at the university? And I think there's four different ways that that happens. Um, some people have argued, well, design should be uh, a sequential uh, sort of knowledge formation where we pit one theory against another and we experiment and we sort of move forward that way, um, the mode primarily from the sciences. So people like the, the design theorist Her, uh, Herbert Simon uh, from the 1960s really felt design, sh the, the best way forward for design was to become a, sci a science. Um, my own background is working with the humanities, so my argument is uh, we want a more aggregative form of uh, design knowledge where you take an object of study, it might be some historical artifact, it might be something like a novel or a play, and you look at it from different perspectives. So I read it first as a post-colonialist, and then I read it as a feminist, and then I read it as a new historicist, and those different lenses don't cancel each other out, but they build up knowledge around the object. I think that's a more natural way for designers to work. Um, exploratory expressive in the fine arts where the idea is knowledge is being created in the sense of uh, you're attempting to produce experiences for other people that somehow communicate a subjective response to what you've produced. And then finally, which I think is actually the case, is there's a, a school of generative knowledge production. There's this fourth epistemology. And there are things like computer science, engineering, design, um, some parts of medicine and chemistry. You know, there's quite a broad range, maybe more than a dozen disciplines. Architecture is one. Um, where we're primarily not interested in the past or in the present, although we want to study those things too, uh, but our primary interest is in what doesn't yet exist. We're, we're always putting ourselves into the future and thinking about uh, what is a possible future, how is that a, uh, different than the the one that we, how, how might we change it from what we are, uh, can predict now to something that we would consider more optimal. Uh, those are really the fundamental concerns of design. So that puts our research into a different mode. Um, you're trying to study the future in a way that uh, um, is generative. You're, you're, both, you're both producing it and studying it. So that's, that's the fundamental um, uh, basis for thinking about uh, prototyping. So the question then becomes, if we're talking about a understanding the future, and one way to do that is through making things. So we think through making, uh, as uh, uh, Tim Ingold in, in archi uh, architecture talked. Uh, and I would say there are uh, primarily three different ways that you use prototypes in that process of creating knowledge about the future. The first is that you treat it as a the prototype as a research instrument. I'm going to make something and then I'm going to put it in front of people and I'm going to get their responses to what happens. So for instance, if I'm interested in a game design, um, we had a project where we looked at uh, um, what would money be like if it expired? So it, uh, it has a deadline. Uh, you can't accumulate it. To investigate that, we set up a game. We don't really know anything about what we're going to understand until we get people in to play the game. So that prototype game is a research instrument. Second, we can interrogate concepts. And this is the primarily what I'm interested in now. I run something called the Design Concepts Lab. And the question is, from a design perspective, what do these various abstract ideas look like so that designers can kind of get their hands on them? So the things we looked at, for instance, are what is an opinion? What is an interpretation? What does it mean to trust something? What is friendship? A whole range of sort of uh, places. There's modeling done in social sciences. There's modeling done in artificial intelligence. Marketing has their own models. But we haven't yet seen a, a, a real groundswell of designers attempting to model these, uh, these ideas uh, using prototyping as their, uh, as their method of understanding. So that's where my work primarily falls, and that's the title. When an idea becomes tangible, we're talking about the tangibility of 
aspects of concepts where we're trying to build up a model and then we'll test the model eventually. But primarily where we've gotten so far is just on build, starting to build those models. And then third, sometimes you can use a prototype to just model the system. It can help you understand what's happening because you're building a maquette. You're building a little scenario um, that then you can play out. So I've got a few examples of that at the end of the, at the, end of the talk too. So uh, the next thing, a little bit about the, the difference between prototyping in, in practice, which is what we primarily know and what we teach our students. Um, how do you go about taking an idea and sort of iterating your way through it until you end up with a new commodity or a service? You end up with something for people to use. So stuff at the end. Along the way, if you're a, specifically if you're a human-centered designer, you're definitely going out and meeting people and interviewing people, observing them using things. You're developing some knowledge. Um, but the goal of that knowledge is really to end up with a, a commodity or a service. So that's design practice. Prototyping in research is a little bit different. You're essentially trying to address a research question. So at the end, you want knowledge. You want an answer. You want some evidence to help you answer the research question. And the prototyping, the stuff that you're building along the way, uh, just becomes something that happens along the way. It doesn't necessarily end up in anything like a commodity or a service. It's just a tool to help you think um, and to produce evidence um, towards the question that you're interested in. So the stuff to use, it's got these kind of characteristics. Uh, uh, it has to be, you know, the sort of functional, usable, pleasurable. Um, it's got to have some viability in the world. So for instance, I'm interested in how people access text online. If I'm building a, if I'm in, in practice, I'm going to for sure include a search box among the tools that I'm going to let them have to access the collection. Everybody knows that you need a search box. If I'm doing prototyping research, the stuff that I'm creating is only useful if it addresses a research question. So I'm going to leave out the search box. Everybody knows I need one. There's no point in me including it. I'm trying to figure out other things. 30, 40 years ago, probably I had to have a search box because we were still figuring those things out. So that's the fundamental difference. You'll see the, the practicality of how the prototypes work uh, changes whether or not you're attempting to end up with something that's uh, uh, viable versus something that's just contributing to your thinking. So that's the stuff to use. Uh, the question about knowledge, the practice, the knowledge I gain is specifically often for that one project. It doesn't even necessarily need to be particularly robust as knowledge uh, as long as it's good enough for me and for my client. If I can convince them, yes, I've talked to the right kind of demographic or you know, they've produced something that they're excited about, my work is done. For the knowledge in prototyping, it, what I'm really hoping is to produce something that will help with many projects. If I can tell you what is an opinion, but how do we under, what are the components that go into opinion? How do you change people's opinions? How do, you, um, how do you strengthen an opinion that they already hold? If I can give you a model of that kind, then any project that involves an opinion, uh, you've got some tool to work with. So that's, you know, it's a much bigger goal and it takes uh, stronger evidence to kind of produce the, uh, something useful. This is another way of looking at the distinction. So this is one of my PhD students, uh, Juan de la Rosa. He uh, was a professor of design, chair of his department down at the National University in Bogota, and has now come up and is working on, uh, uh, primarily his, his topic is uh, how values get subtly embedded in infrastructure, and how a subtle change to the infrastructure can change uh, the values that are being communicated. Um, but on the, on, on the way, of course, he looked at my previous diagrams and said, okay, I can explain that a little bit better. So here's the model that you're all used to in design practice. You start with a topic. I'm going to create some way to access text online. I'm going to diverge on ideas. I'm going to produce a variety of potential solutions. Then I'm going to select among those solutions and converge down. And as I go, the space gets smaller and smaller. So. I, I diverge, I've got a, a large number of opportunities, I start to converge into a narrow space, 
I do the process again, and at the end, I've got my commodity or service. I've sort of figured it out. Here's the thing that I'm going to produce. And that's the, that's the prototyping cycle. In the research cycle, it's a little bit different again. What I'm primarily interested in is not a single image of the future. This is the solution. But here are a variety of possibilities, each one of which helps me understand that that solution space, that potential future. And that future might include a whole variety of ways to access text online. It may question the very notion of what is a text, what is access. All those kinds of things might be built into the prototyping. So you can see I start from a topic area. By the time I've uh, converged and diverged a few times, I end up with an even bigger space than I started with. And I've got multiple prototypes at the end. Um, that are suggesting to me uh, some understanding of that future state of the system. So there's two different ways of kind of looking at um, how this type of prototyping that I'm advocating in this talk is, is somewhat different uh, than the kind of prototyping that most of us are used to doing. So the first thing, uh, collection access I had mentioned before, this is, this is the use of a prototype as a research instrument. I'm going to make some things and I'm not going to know much about them until I get people to try to use them. So that's my research question. I'm interested in collection access. We eventually produced a theory. So my first book just describes this theory and all the experiments that went into producing it called Rich Prospect Browsing. The idea being if you've got a collection that's under about 5,000 items, one very productive way of approaching allowing people to access that is to put all of those items on the screen and then let people manipulate that display. So it's that combination. Get everything on the screen and then let them organize it, subset it, show connections between it. Whatever your metadata will support, you end up producing you know, a set of tools around this, this form of access. So this is... Um, this is a theory that we developed through using the kinds of prototypes that you, you, that you bring out as, uh, as um, instruments to collect data. This is something from, that pro from those projects. It's called a Mandela browser. Um, the idea is I've got a text collection shown as little tiny gray dots. So each one of these dots around the periphery is a paragraph. In fact, in this case, it's a blog post. Um, there's an event they call the Day of Digital Humanities, and once a year, people all around the world get together and talk about their day. So we took one year's data from the Day of Digital Humanities and, and put it into this tool, and then we can see what's possible to be done with it. So if this little video works, you can see I call up uh, 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 some of the metadata that I've created, I'm going to turn that blue dot into a query, and it's going to pull in every text that has to do with my query. So the first one is teaching. Anywhere that somebody in the Day of Digital Humanities talked about teaching, it gets called in. The next one is research. And of course, the third one is going to be administration, because those are the three parts of being a professor, right? You always have those three commitments. But in the Digital Humanities, they also make an argument that there's a fourth category, which is interdisciplinary collaboration. Like designers, the digital humanists spend a lot of time working together. So we put together a query here where we're looking at meetings that aren't administrative, that aren't part of the administrative process. They're, they're a different kind of meeting. And there we have some evidence. You can see people spend almost an equal amount of time, 99 matches here, 86 there, 99 over here. Um, they spend almost as much time in these interdisciplinary collaborations as they do in the other three parts of their job. So if you're a, a, a digital humanist, and I would argue probably a designer, uh, really you've got four parts to your job. And that's uh, something that we can easily show using a tool that is essentially what's happening under the hood. It's constructing a SQL query, a, a complex SQL query against the database saying, give me this and this and this. Show me the subsets between them. So here's the posts where somebody talked about uh, teaching and admin in the same post. 
here's the posts where they talked about research and uh, collaborative meetings in the same in the same post. So it's these pie-shaped ones that are really the most interesting. One of the things we learn, of course, from a visualization like this is uh, what's wrong with it. Uh, since those are the most important parts, they should probably be the biggest things on the screen. You know, this isn't necessarily a good design. Um, but it was enough to show us that we could take this to a, to a literature professor and they can create a complex query visually, one step at a time, without even thinking that that's what they're doing. So this was some of the support that we used to develop the theory of rich prospect browsing. I've got some other just stills that we took here. So this is um, what kinds of meetings do they have? Are they Skype meetings? Are they, are they phone calls? Uh, this is a question, uh, how much of that involves travel? Um, a lot of it is uh, conference travel. So we start to look at some of these things. You can click on these and read the texts that are behind them. And you start to realize, oh, this uh, big category of meeting, a lot of it is, is taking advantage of opportunities where you're already together. So you'll, you'll take an extra day at the end of a conference and they'll get together and do a research team uh, meeting. Uh, we asked them a little bit, or we asked the system a little bit about, food, about uh, where they talked about different times of day. And it looks like lunch is a very important part of being a digital humanist. It's the biggest thing. We asked them about what they drink. And surprisingly, alcohol is quite small. So I suspect they, they just didn't report uh, on that part. Uh, but coffee certainly figured in as a, as a significant component of, of the lives of the digital humanists. So there's a tool. Uh, if I just create the Mandela browser, I don't know anything about it. I've got to take it out and have people try it, or I've got to try it myself. You know, we learn by seeing people using it. Here's another uh, uh, digital humanities tool. I've got three to show you in total, so this is the second one. Uh, and this is a project that, uh, that my wife did working on um, an 18th century novel called Clarissa. It's the, one of the worst novels ever written. Uh, a million words long. Um, it's written in letters, it's an epi in epistolary form, uh, and it's a tragedy. So the question she was asking was, uh, using this visualization, you can show where search terms appear uh, across, across texts. So this is the, f the first 10 chapters of the book, or the first 10 letters of the book. And you can see each line represents the number of, of words in that uh, section. And the search terms show up as dots, uh, bigger or smaller, depending sort of how many there are within a little span of, of, a, of a paragraph. Um, so Lovelace is the term we've looked at here, and he's the villain. Uh, in the end, he's going to uh, do all sorts of villainous things that end up in the death of the, of the heroine. If you click on any of these dots, you call up the text, so you can start to read a little bit of, of context around what's going on. Now we add another line. Uh, where does the father show up? This is an 18th century novel, so we're in a patriarchal England. The father should have a major presence in dealing with the, the suitor, in dealing with Lovelace. And you can see from the green lines, he's not particularly active. He's not showing up uh, at the beginning of the, the novel. Who is showing up is the brother. So if you compare, you know, look at a line like this. Here's a mention of Lovelace at the beginning, so we know that's what they're talking about. The father shows up three or four times, and the brother is just all over the place. So what we're, what we're seeing visually is uh, there's a problem. The, the patriarch has not taken control of the situation in a way that he should have. He's abdicated his responsibility to the son. Even the uncle... Uh, who shows up in the red line uh, has more frequency, shows up more frequently at the beginning of this book than the father does. So that's the argument that Susan was making, saying, well, this is a bad setup. You can see it right away in the first 10 chapters of the book. And you can do that and you can understand, I mean, 
I just explained a theory about an 18th century, a million word 18th century novel uh, by using this sort of uh, visual scoring uh, of comparative search results and where they show up. Some of these, by the way, the, uh, both the ones I've showed so far, uh, did end up turning into some sort of a tool. So people could go out and find them online and, and make use of them. Um, but our intention was really to ask these questions about having um, multiple items on the screen at the same time that you could sort of manipulate that display. The third and final one, this is a, a theatrical visualization. Uh, you're seeing a, a reconstruction of the scene in Julius Caesar just before he's killed. So we've got the little characters, they look like uh, chess pieces because it's not a play, uh, it's a simulation of a play. So we don't really have actors, we don't have costumes, we have these little, little guys, they have noses, right? So you know which way they're facing and they have some articulation so that they can kneel or sit, um, but really quite minimal movement for the, for the characters, but quite a realistic set. So we've got a realistic um, uh, stage, the realistic theater, and then we've got a realistic um, stage uh, constructed on top of that. And then as the little characters move around, their texts play out beside them. So you can kind of watch the script and see the blocking. And you can do it from jumping around to different points in the theater. So it's, uh, it's not necessary to see it from one angle. You can see it from the perspective of one of the characters, you can see it from somewhere off in the seating. Um, it's, a, it's a nice way of either planning plays uh, to begin with or uh, studying archival histories of plays where you can kind of bring a bunch of material together and say, okay, here's how they staged this one. Now here's the same play staged by a different group this other different way. So it, it's sort of a potential, potential archival tool. There's another shot. Uh, we've turned all of the people except Caesar into dogs. Um, so the idea is he's about to be attacked by the, by the animals. Um, this turned out not to be a tool, uh, in part because what we learned from it suggested that there were variations that we needed that we didn't have. There was, there's missing affordances here that are important um, to those archival researchers and to the people producing plays. Um, and it's all based on XML uh, underneath the hood. And really the only way to get it sort of set up so that it runs like, it, like you would expect it to is to go in and work on the XML. So that's too much to ask. For the user group that we had in mind, they really want to be able to ma manipulate the stage, not go in and manipulate some metadata. So um, th that was one of the things that we learned here is we, we had to figure out better ways. And we haven't done that. So then now the second use of prototypes. How can you use a prototype to address an abstract uh, concept? And this is an exercise I gave to my um, graduate students this last fall. I said, let's take, um, we'll start with trust. What does it mean to trust something? And how can you manipulate that as a designer? What are all the aspects of trust? And can we start to build a model that will help designers who have to work with, with trust uh, beyond the models that are coming from psychology and sociology and other places? So the first thing, the students just produced a whole bunch of things. I gave them one week. So not, high, not anything with a high polish. Um, this is a little bit difficult to see. It's, a, it's essentially a fold out uh, and it's a, on, the, on the front of the thing it says, this is where you keep, this is a trust keeper. This is where I maintain my trust. And when you open it up, there's a mirror inside. And so the student's argument is, well, until you know about yourself, uh, you can't know about other people. So there's a, a self-reflective uh, component. Here's somebody thinking about authority. If I show up with a badge, what does that do? Does that, does that symbol of authority um, come with an extra degree of trust or an extra degree of mistrust? How does, how does it work in, in, um, as a component? The third one here's a, a redesign. This is a student, uh, obviously, instead of doing a dozen, did sort of one, uh, but she took the standard lease, uh, apartment contract uh, that you sign, you know, when you're taking out a, 
a student place. And they're often, in the U.S., you know, 17, 20 pages of fine print. Uh, they can be just a real, a real problem. You know, you can get into situations where you've committed to something that you don't want and there's no way out of it. Um, the, there, isn't, there aren't particular standards that the communities enforce. So there's a lot going on in leases in the United States. So she said, well, let's, let's just produce a one-page designed document that hits the highlights. The tenant is responsible for the utilities. You have a numbered space. That's the only place you can park. You know, she's gone through all 17 things and created a, a sort of a one-page summary. Is this more trustworthy? Am I more inclined to trust this designed object than I am those 17 pages of small print? That's essentially the question that she's raising with this artifact. Here's a really simple thing. It's, a, it's an eraser, and she's written the word trust on it. And the idea is if trust is violated, uh, sometimes you can correct that. But the more you have to correct it, the more the eraser erodes. So trust starts to break down the more I have to repair it uh, because of some sort of a deficit. So you can see quite a nice range of different ideas coming, different factors coming together. Um, we had a filmmaker in the class and he was interested in this notion of the violation of trust. So he started out with this uh, a few minutes a clip of a sort of an ocean shore. There's not much content. There's some quiet music playing. Uh, you're seeing the waves lap in. You're kind of getting into this zen-like state. And then his question is, and so what does it take to betray that? He just changes the color. And suddenly you're dealing with a, a red screen instead of a gray screen. Uh, it's jarring. Uh, with the change in the rest of the video, you really start to see um, some significant difference. I'm sorry about this projection. It's not... Uh, it's not really doing justice to the, to the thing that it's there, but it's a little bit subtle. Um, so, yeah, so people working from a different perspective, some with documents, some with physical objects, some with um, uh, video. I made the requirement for the students that uh, they couldn't use the same media twice. So they did uh, four different concepts in the course of the class, and then they did their own uh, thesis topic. Uh, and if, if they had used a physical object in one of them, that was it. They couldn't use physical objects again. So I, I added that extra bit of complexity. So some of them did experience design, some of them did, um, you know, uh, electronic things, websites, those kinds of, of things in addition to what you've seen here. And then we take it all together and we start to work towards a model. So here was one of the things that we said. You've got this Question, what is the proclivity to believe? How does it work? Well, it works within a particular context for particular stakes that might be high or low. Um, but from the starting perspective as a designer, you can take the human factors and you can map them against uh, what is the initial status? Am I starting from a situation of trust deficit where some betrayal has already happened and people aren't trusting each other? or a neutral position, or a positive position, where uh, trust has been established and is built. So just knowing that, and then mapping it across all the, uh, the, the standard domains, you could take these, you could, uh, you could take these one at a time, or you could sort of combine them. It's, a, it's the sort of standard human factors approach, but now applied to, to the idea of trust. So this is as far as we got in two weeks of a graduate class last fall. Uh, but you can see none of those, none of those uh, prototypes are going to essentially lead to anything that you could buy or sell. They aren't about commodities or services. Um, although you might think of ways that you could potentially turn them into something. But their goal is to really help you think about the factors that go into this model. You start to build up the model. Some of you probably know Glaser and Strauss and the sort of grounded theory way of working. Um, the idea in grounded theory is you're going to produce a theory rather than start with a theory. So you have your topic, you go out and collect a bunch of data. That data starts to produce a theory and eventually you get it robust enough that then you can go down and test it. Um, this is a, uh, 
a version of that but using prototypes instead of uh, social science data. So the next one, um, we looked first at the social science concepts. We did trust, we did friendship. Then we said, well, what about other kinds of concepts? Maybe we can look at things from the sciences. Um, so I assigned them to look at the uh, gene editing technology. And some of you will come across it and maybe some of you haven't. But within the last 10 years, maybe even five years or so, um, the three or four methods that we have to change uh, people's DNA or to change DNA in general um, have gone through a kind of a revolutionary change where uh, using this particular technique, um, it's quite simple to do. You can buy online a CRISPR kit and go home tonight and do some gene modification. It's one of the, one of the commodities uh, that's now av available from biochemistry. It's just ridiculous. Um, essentially what CRISPR is, it, um, it comes, it's a, it's, a, it's a particular type of, um, of mechanism that we took from a bacteria. The bacteria kept a record of all the viruses that had attacked it. And when a new virus came in of the kind it recognized, it would send out a pair of scissors and they would just cut the virus up. And we said, all right, we'll take those scissors out and then we can use them as a cut and paste tool on anything. So you can take a piece of DNA and you can just cut a section out of it and seal it up again. You can cut out a piece and put something else in there. So, you know, I expect there will be glow in the dark people before very long. Um, after the students worked on this last fall, uh, there was a scandal, of course, because in China someone crispered a couple of babies. Um, so then people more heard more about the technique. Uh, he was trying to make them uh, resistant to HIV uh, was the purpose of the, the CRISPRing. But it's, um, uh, it's now a big international controversy. Well, what's, how do we regulate this technology that's just kind of jumped into uh, potentially popular use? You know, you don't need to be much of a biochemist to use it. Um, so the students... Uh, because, they're, because they're design students, it's very difficult to get them to think of not a commodity or service. And when we talked about the hard science ones, they really, that really came back again. So here we have a line of cosmetics. Synthago is the name of the company that will sell you a CRISPR kit. So this is the um, uh, cosmetics. You want brighter eyes? Well, we're not just going to fool around with the surface. We're going to go and change your, D your eye DNA. And that will uh, accomplish the, the thing, and, and presumably only in a sort of a temporary way. You know, it's not, uh, it's not going to be a 100% permanent change. It might change some percentage, and then you've got to reapply it, or else it doesn't become a very good commodity. Um, another student came out with the whole idea of uh, uh, CRISPR water. So you're, you just drink this stuff, and the process uh, uh, gives you some additional um, better hearing, better uh, uh, tactility, you know, whatever it might be that you want. Um, and again, uh, the, the, the tension between how do, you, how do you think about something that's fundamentally changing your, your, your genome uh, and, a, and a product. So this is the kind of things that they were thinking about. Uh, here's somebody, they're going out for the evening, and so they've decided that they're going to have a bit of animal uh, in their DNA for the weekend. Um, here's somebody else, and she's decided she's going to be a vegetable. So replacing her hair with a, a sort of a succulent uh, plant. Um, these, you know, they, it just seems r ridiculous as a, as, a as a technology, and yet... Uh, it exists, and these aren't particularly far-fetched. The kinds of things that you can do, you know, put a little bit of fish into my carrots, put a little bit of, you know, lion into my DNA. Um, there's all sorts of things. But, of course, what it's primarily been promoted for and is, is being used for are medical treatments of various kinds. So if there's some genetic basis for a condition, um, people have been looking into the, the changes that are happening. 
Um, so like the CRISPR water, one of the ones that they're particularly interested in is longevity. Can we figure out how to have, make people live longer and healthier uh, lives by making genetic modifications? They've done some remarkable advances. Uh, I don't have this, the images of it, but there's, uh, there's a mouse that they took and uh, aged dramatically. So it was all wrinkled and lost all its hair. Went in and applied the, the CRISPR change to the um, telomeres, you know, the, the parts on the ends of your DNA that are sort of the cap that wears down over time. They now know how to extend those caps. And within days, the mouse suddenly looks like a normal mouse again. It's lost all its wrinkles and it's grown all its fur back. So, you know, on the, on the lab, on the, you know, sort of bench to, to popular use is 10, 15 years. We're at that point already on the, on the bench. Um, so we'll live to see all, you know, all these remarkable choices. But from my, what, what I learned from this is how hard it was for the students to think about these ideas without thinking in terms of commodities or services and that they didn't really end up going very deep into the technology itself. Um, they, you know, it wasn't easy for them to kind of understand how it worked. Um, they had about the same level of understanding that I've talked about here. You know, it's essentially a cut and paste function. Um, but if you really, if you look into it, of course, it's a, it's a whole discipline. Um, whether or not we could start to build a theory around how designers might respond to CRISPR in sort of social action or how they might in, end up using CRISPR in their own design uh, processes. Um, we, we didn't really get that far uh, in the course of what we were doing. But again, this was the, uh, this was the intent. Interrogate this scientific concept using the uh, series of prototypes. The other one we did was uh, graphene, which you'll know is a, a sort of a revolutionary material if um, uh, the, the question I asked the students, why don't we have space elevators now? Why do we not just have a satellite around the earth and we drop a long rope down and then you can go up and down the rope? You know, that seems like a fairly straightforward thing. People had talked about them in science fiction back in the 50s. Well, the problem is we don't have anything to make the rope out of. Anything that would be long enough and strong enough uh, would collapse under its own weight after a couple of kilometers. So it's not, it's not possible. Graphene is a single molecule thick, stronger than steel, lighter than air, uh, has these ridiculous electrochemical properties. Um, if you've ever heard of the blackest black, uh, I forget who it was who designed it, but it's essentially graphene. You know, it's, a, it's got these optical uh, properties. So I had them look at that too as a, as a thing. And they went from, you know, everything from uh, uh, somebody had, had the idea, well, we'll we'll get spiders to weave spider silk using graphene, right? And then we'll have this material that's 10 times stronger and 10 times lighter. Uh, right up to, you know, we'll create Dyson spheres, which is, you know, you sort of surround your entire sun with a globe that just captures all the energy and you live on the surface of that globe. And there's some, you know, theorists who said, one of the steps that civilizations go through will be producing those kinds of technologies. And with something like graphene or a carbon nanotubes is another way people talk about it. Um, we might have a material that's getting close to being able to produce these kinds of, of um, massive architectural projects. So they, they did, I think, uh, sort of a comparable job dealing with the, the new material uh, question. And then the last one, of course, just said, well, how about everything? You know, you'll just have a pick list. So you'll go into the, the clinic and say, well, I need more confidence. Give me, modify my confidence gene a little bit. I've got a job interview coming up. Or I need to be stronger. Um, one of the things you can look online, um, some Chinese scientists managed to take a whippet, you know, the very skinny little dog, and they hulked it out. So it looks like it's, you know, it's got, it's got massive musculature. Um, so that's already possible. Uh, whether or not you can do uh, creativity, we'd have to find the genes that are involved for creativity. Um, so there's a lot to go on. But there, there's this kind of idea that, well, maybe uh, once this becomes a common technology, people will, will uh, 
pick and choose the kinds of of changes that they want to see. The other interesting thing about it, you, you can you can CRISPR uh, in in um, utero, uh, so it affects the the child. You can you can affect multiple generations because you're modifying the DNA, or you can also affect full grown adults. Um, so the mechanism there is you know either it, it gets ru it rubbed in and absorbed, or inhaled, or you drink it. Um, the delivery mechanisms are quite straightforward. So there's uh, CRISPR. How can prototyping be used? So now, having traumatized everyone with this <laughs> future of genetic modification, um, how, can, uh, how can we use prototyping to understand systems as opposed to understanding uh, concepts? And one way to do it is, is to, uh, um, to do exper essentially experience design. So here's a group of students in, in Poland last spring. We did this, this exercise with them. Um, and they were interested in the experiences of animals under various conditions. So this thing that's on the side here, this is a horse trailer. It's, a, it's got very limited visibility. It's on wheels. The students could get in it and push each other around and start to get the experience of what it's like to be a horse inside a trailer which is quite a traumatic experience in many ways. Um, there's not much to go on. The wooden box in the background is uh, um, chicken containment. Um, so the idea they would put several students in there so they're nice and packed together. And the floor was set up so it was uneven so you could never get comfortable. And then of course you just had the air holes to kind of peek out. Um, this group decided to take an interest in uh, fish so it's a little bit difficult to see, but both those women are inside aquaria. So they're uh, just contained in a, a clear plastic box. And of course, somebody immediately came over and tapped on the glass. And uh, they talked about the experience of fish uh, in aquaria in um, commercial settings. Sometimes maybe the fish start to know the fish in the, in the aquarium next to them, and then they have no control. So someone takes them out and takes them away, and they're they sort of never see that other fish again. So a kind of a Walt Disney understanding of fish. Um, but a little bit of a, you know, uh, experiential design. So your, 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 your prototype is an aquarium. Your prototype is a, a model of a, a chicken coop. This is a team, they were interested in artificial intelligence. So they created this sort of uh, foam object, cylinder, and said, uh, now I'm going to train this artificial intelligence so that it understands me. I'm going to give it input from, from my personal data throughout the, the year until it starts to become a companion uh, creature for me. Uh, so this is the model. You've got these different sizes. These, the, these are the inputs to the system. The whole thing constitutes the artificial intelligence. Just <coughs> tapping on the center of that foam then produces a pattern that is a unique pattern. So you start to get a little bit of an understanding of how the neural network training works. Different, different changes, slight changes can result in quite different um, configurations of the, of the AI. So they, they, I should say they were particularly working with neural nets um, as the, the basis for what they were thinking about. So this is a metaphorical model to help us understand artificial intelligence and how it goes about being uh, trained. And then they could tell stories about, well, you know, I've got, my, I've got my companion artificial intelligence and it's giving me advice about what I'm doing in my day or it's helping out with what, my homework, you know, whatever it is that you're, that you're doing. Um, I think that's, that's more or less it. Thanks to all the people that have funded me over the years, that's always... That's always nice. And I've got to uh, uh, thank you to you uh, for your time. And then I've got an Easter egg at the end. This is a project a student did around uh, when do we start indoctrinating people culturally? <laughs> so she put the flags right on the part that goes in the baby's mouth. You know, it's not it's, it's for the baby. And I think, you know, for Canada, this is kind of hu humorous. We're, we're not, our national identity isn't, isn't something that we worry about at the infant level 
although there may be, it may be true that, that there's indoctrination. In the U.S., I think it could be a commodity. You know, they're, they're so interested in, you know, are we American and what does it mean to be American? And, you know, you've heard all the, di uh, all the dialogue. And China, um, similarly, I think there's a, there's a strong, you know, right from, from very young in, in China, you're, uh, um, you're learning what it means to be uh, Chinese and to be post, uh, post revolutionary. Every Chinese child every day at school uh, wears a white shirt with a red scarf. Uh, the red for the blood of the martyrs of the revolution. So from, you know, certainly the time, maybe not the time that you start your feeding, but uh, from the first time that you go to school, um, you've got a, you, you're, you're wearing a political object. Um, so yeah, so then that's all sort of communicated in a nice simple, um, some people say, uh, uh, I ran into somebody today, she called it, uh, oh, that's uh, punct. Uh, you just, you get the point. You know, you don't need a whole lot of context to understand what's going on. All right, so that's it. Thank you, Stanley. Um, now we have time for questions and answers, and we have a mic here. Yeah. Who's asking um, this one? Yeah, we can start with Chris. Yeah. Hi there, my name is. Okay. Hi there, my name is Christian. Um, I was a little bit interested in have you considered using your uh, your uh, uh, mandala project with uh, combining it with genes uh, for CRISPR in that sort of way, if you're looking at the relationship between different gene expressions um, and how they can be mapped or databased or modeled for use in CRISPR. That is fantastic. Yeah, no, I have not put those two together whatsoever. Okay. But it's nice. You, you see this sort of generic visualization, and you think, yeah, why would that? That could potentially apply. The trick will be there. Uh, you would have to work just with sort of the identified sequences rather than the, you know, the whole genome is too big for that display. The most we've ever put into it, I think, was 15,000 items. Um, so, yeah, you would need to be a bit selective before you could start. Well, maybe an AI to the human genome, or API to the human genome project, so you can directly import the database from there. Nice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I like. It. <laughs> I have a follow-up question for the Mandala. Uh, is it is it true that I've seen the the, the same setting with the money transfers? It can be used for detecting where the money is coming, oh, yeah. to whom it's going. Yeah, not a, not a visualization that I did, but my colleague Juan Salamanca, mm -hmm. uh, uh, who is from Cali down in Colombia, uh, worked with some of the banks, the local bank, on visualizations across uh, transfers of funds. Um, so we got him out of Colombia before he was murdered. Um, he's now a professor at University of Illinois. Uh, but yeah, one of the things you could do with that is start to look at uh, questions like money laundering, um, corruption. You know, corruption of various kinds. I, I use the Mandela itself in the, uh, the public data from the city of Chicago, uh, which is unusable. You know, you talk about these smart cities where the oh, we'll, we'll, we'll bring in a chief information officer and we'll make all the city's data available. And what they did is broke it up into spreadsheets and just gave you folders and folders and folders of spreadsheets with no obvious indexing between them. So, but I did manage to put together ones around, some mandala displays around um, uh, who had received uh, gifts, because they have to keep track of, of what a gift was and to what a, you know, how much it was and so on. And uh, some of those were quite alarming. You know, there was one unit in particular, suddenly, you know, the, the whole screen was filled up with gifts to this one sort of political unit. And then on who was giving gifts, there was an equal, you know, sort of one organization that was, that was connecting the two of them. And I left that alone because, you know, there's only so much hope that you have in the world. So, yeah, so you can apply. We, we've seen the Mandel applied uh, both, you know, to literary studies, uh, sociology. Uh, somebody was looking at interviews with people who'd adopted... Canadians who had adopted babies from China. And so there's a brokering agency, and then there's the, 
the parents, the family in China, and then there's the family in Canada. And she had interview data with all of those. And she produced a very nice set of, of visualizations around how those different people talked about the experience that they'd had. I should say, the, I showed you three visualizations out of the digital humanities. In that, in that decade of work, we produced about 35. So there's a vast pile of various qualities of visualization that we've worked on. It was more a clarification um, regarding one of your diagrams, the um, divergence convergence. Oh, yes. Where you have some um, constellations of items. And as you went from one to the next, they, they seem to be very similar. So was the idea that each of those constellations at each stage in the process would be the same choice of possible outcomes? Does that no. make sense? No. They were supposed to be, uh, they were supposed to be inter interrogating different, different pieces with each iteration. Yeah, but, but the, the actual... The visualization of it seemed to be that they were all exactly the same. Yeah. Uh, so it was like that's the same palette of possible outcomes that you were choosing from at each stage, even though time had passed. Does Thank that you for sense? that. I'll pass that along to Juan. Okay. So they, we won't, he won't make that mistake in his dissertation. Okay. Fine. Yeah, no, that's great. Although I should say, I suppose it's true that some would be, right? It's as any iterative process, you know, you might find something and then you're going to you're gonna, like the, the Mandela browser, that's, that's version 1,537 that I was showing. You know, so we iterated that for 10 years probably. But, but it was more the case of that new insights would then appear as a new possible exactly. in addition to the others. Yeah. yeah, so in the case of the Mandela, the new insights were coming from its application in new areas, right, as opposed to different kinds of, of prototypes altogether. The other thing that Juan has done is, so in that case, we sort of suggested a single, a single layered model too. And, and now what he's saying is, well, let's, let's think of it more like a Gaussian blur. So you've got uh, layers uh, stacked on top of each other where each layer uh, represents a different value uh, in, the, in the infrastructure. Nice. Thanks. Hi again. Now I have an actual question. Or <laughs> um, so, one of the. Do you have any advice for professors um, that are interested in teaching uh, design methodologies from different perspectives, of which they perhaps are not? Um, they are not uh, experts in. So, let's say, for example, the design challenges changes every semester or changes every year, um, and some sort of perhaps the methodologies that you would use would change every year. Do you have a, a go-to? Uh, manual or you have a do you have any sort of advice that you would suggest oh I uh, use Kumar's 101 design methods okay great uh, I, I know that book yeah All right. so it, you know you can you can have the students I just finished teaching design methods in fact um, we did two different clients and uh, I had each team talk about uh, choose different methods to try to use um, and then uh, sort of explained it you know, all to everyone as they as they progressed so yeah, that's what 2013, maybe 20. It's fairly recent. Yeah. And and the problem with with that book is the 101 methods uh, were largely taken from industry. So people sort of well, let's try this, you know, and it seems to work, and the client paid, so that's a good method, you know. Like there isn't a lot of kind of empirical work or, or good solid research behind probably 98 of them. Um, but uh, you know, we, a lot of them we know. So, well, then can I can I ask a follow up question there? How do you how do you how do you gather data about the usage of these different design tools? Yeah, you would need to treat one as a study, right, and kind of go out and and see. Uh, I think one of the, one of the fundamental problems with them is, uh, say, you use a framework, for instance, something like uh, like poems. Uh, poems is a framework that's supposed to be a checklist to help you remember as a student. Uh, I need to look at people. I need to look at objects. I need to look at the environment. Um, I, I've got a, a sort of a, a set of criteria, and when I've when I've gone through all of those, I've, I I haven't missed anything. You know, it's a like a safety net for for students to use. But of course, the framework itself misses things. 
So there is no political dimension to poems. There is no economic dimension to poems. Um, so I think one of the things that you might want to look at in, in studying these, uh, these methods is both what they include and what they leave out and what are the implications of them having sort of gone one way versus another. And that's why I think of them as sort of arbitrary. You know, well, here's the five things that you don't want to forget. Well, whoever was doing that consultancy with their clients, those were the five things of importance to those clients. And that's, you know, he's got a spread on each method, right? So he doesn't kind of go into any of that, that history of how the thing was developed or, or um, what, are its, what are its dangers or its limitations. And the, the fact that who teach from it, so I was at IIT when he was writing it, right? And we were all sort of teaching these methods. Um, they, they put those warnings into the classroom, um, but they're not kind of built into the, the textbook. So I would, I would like to see a version of that where, you know, there, here's five design methods well researched. You know, that would be a great book. Can I ask one more follow-up just related to that? Sure. Um, is there a good way to gather that tacit knowledge from the students perhaps that are experimenting with these, with these methods that you can then use for the next generation or for the next class? Purely in a pedagogical way. Um, yeah, yeah. Not, not with the students that I was working with. I mean, so these are undergraduate classes. These are the kind of the first time that they'd been working with them. Um, so they were really just, you know, first time users. Um, I think you would probably do better to go out to consultancies uh, and spend some time in sort of an ethnographic way, right, seeing how they were applying them and whether they were finding uh, potential flaws that weren't getting into the literature is the mm. problem. So there is some potential knowledge uh, being developed, but it just never gets disseminated in a way that's accessible to to us or to our students. Although I also resist that idea that that's where all the research is happening, mm. because I really do feel a lot of what's happening in consultancies is um, they're inventing things, but they're not, you know, they're at a pretty uh, superficial uh, level of understanding. Thank you. Yes, so you've been working so much with visualization in various ways. Uh, I've also been very interested in visualization in relation to design research, uh, but I've primarily focused on photography, so I was wondering if any of your projects have included that in some form? Anything to do with photography. So a colleague of mine in um, University of Nova, not University, but working in Nova Scotia, so I think he's at Acadia is the name of the university, created a version of the mandala that's only for photographic or uh, image-based data. Um, I can't remember what the heck he calls it, um, but it's, uh, it allows you to do that same sort of set of apply some metadata and then group and subset and, and reset. John uh, Soklovsky is his name. So yeah, I can put you in, in connection with that. And, but, but they weren't, he, had, he wasn't applying it to designers. You know, it wasn't design photography he was interested in. It was, he's a literary scholar, so he was looking at, you know, paintings by William Blake, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, so a little bit of work has been done there. We also, we also did one, I probably can't find it very quickly, but it was, um, it was an entire uh, screen uh, with little, you know, images attached. Um, so, you know, just a, an, an array of images, uh, and those were all photographic. So uh, you could organize and subset. Uh, for instance, I might take the faces of everybody in this room and use it as a tool to kind of remember who was here, you know, who I talked to. Um, we did some experiments around uh, the, the metadata. What, if, if people had a, a conference with 80 participants and they had three months to use the tool, and they had 14 kinds of data, what would they act, you know, what, what would, would they use, like uh, whether or not you had glasses or what your hair was like or eye color or what, you know, what would it be across, and we had 14 different kinds of metadata. And in that study, we found they used all of them equally. So five to 7% of the time, you know, I might, I might search you based on what university you're from. 5% of the time, I might remember your eye color. You know, it was, just, it was remarkable. And what it said to me was, you know, coming from sort of the computing science end of things, we often say, well, find the best 
path to the data, right? There's going to be 80% of the time people will find something the same way. And that study showed exactly the opposite, that the more ways you could give them into it, the more ways they, they would preferentially use. Yeah, it was again, uh, maybe just thinking about, you were talking about the metadata. Um, is that put in manually, or are you using various types of automated systems or artificial intelligence to do it? Yeah, we've done it both ways. Um, so uh, I worked for, in my dissertation work with something called the Orlando Project, which is a history of women's writing in the British Isles. They've got biographies of about 1,200 women writers, and they keep adding to it every year. And they encoded in XML, you know, there is, there is volumes more encoding than there is text in the Orlando project. So we had this nice manually produced, you know, body over about 15 years of manual work uh, by a team of, you know, three faculty members and a dozen graduate students throughout that whole period. So that was a lovely test bed to kind of work with in terms of, of manually encoded material. And then we used that to train um, in a Weka system, so could we automatically then tag things similar to what they had tagged in the Orlando process, and we got some really great results. Um, but we didn't, again, sort of pursue it, right? We kind of figured it out, published a little bit about it, and then left it alone. So, yeah, we've used both. I think in the humanities, there's still a quite a strong, I mean, now there are, I have a, a colleague in Canada, for instance, who's the, the, the humanities representative to the artificial intelligence research community, you know, in Canada. Um, so they're starting to do a little bit more of that kind of work. But um, for many years, it was just manually enrich your data. Because it, it begs the question of bias. Because once you start to train machines, then you have to go back and check, have, they, have you built in a bias into the way it's work, working with all the material? Yeah, and someone like Susan Hockey or Susan Brown, um, a couple of the sort of stars of the digital humanities community, have said things like, uh, every encoding is an interpretation. So they admit quite openly, you know, uh, even for something as monumentally encoded as the Orlando Project, uh, there are whole topic areas they never dealt with at all. Right, so that's... Uh, um, it's certainly true, and, and in AI training, you know, it's, it's definitely uh, fundamentally dependent on the, on the training data that goes in. This is a problem, of course, in the U.S. Uh, I don't know if it's happened in Europe, but there are commercial AI products that are like recommender systems. And there's one in particular that judges use in sentencing people, and the AI will give you a score uh, for possible recidivism. So how likely is it that you're standing in front of me, I'm the judge, that you're going to commit the crime again? I get a score. And, the, and it's proprietary data. They, the company hasn't released how they trained it. But you can go back and retroactively try it, put in some, and it turns out, yeah, it's ridiculously biased. They were probably using data from the 1960s, you know heavily racialized and, and stereotyped. But, you know, it's still sitting on the judge's bench. So, yeah, not only, not only CRISPR, but also AI. Is, we've got some, you know, the technology has jumped too far ahead of, of kind of our, our design thinking, of our ethical thinking. Okay, thank you. Thank you.